what's up, everyone? I'm excited about today's guest on the show, and his name is Dr. Amit Goswami. Dr. Amit Goswami is a retired theoretical quantum physicist professor. He's a pioneer of the new paradigm of science called Science Within Consciousness, and has appeared in the movies What the Bleep Do We Know, Dalai Lama Renaissance, as well as award-winning documentary The Quantum Activist. A prolific writer, teacher, and visionary, Dr. Goswami is the author of several books such as The Self-Aware Universe, Physics of the Soul, The Quantum Doctor, Quantum Economics, and God is Not Dead, which is what we'll be talking about today. So, Amit, it's good to have you on the show. Good to be here, Joshua. Awesome. You know, uh, you wrote a book called, actually, you know, let me talk about how I first discovered you. I read your book, God is Not Dead, several years ago while I was still living in the Philippines. And I got to say, there's a lot of good stuff in it, you know, to get people thinking. But before we get into all this quantum talk, uh, I'd like to hear more of your personal story. You know, where did you grow up? Uh, were you born into a religious home? And, you know, what got you interested in quantum physics, etc.? So can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, yes, glad to. Um, I was born in a religious spiritual home, and that probably made a huge difference to mm. how I am now. Um, but to tell you the truth, lots of things happened in my childhood which were not very uh, conducive to either religiosity or spirituality, namely famines and riots in that part of the world, and then we had to shift home. Uh -huh. I leave my parents to go live with my, my brother for a while, uh -huh. and so all that was very traumatic. And <laughs> As a result, I lost all the spiritual influence of my father. Oh. <laughs> became uh, interested in science, and uh, that's where I was as a scientific materialist for a long time until um, I was at a conference in 1973 and a crystallizing experience took place, which uh, raised the question about changing. Mm. So I changed. Yeah. What, what country was this, by the way? Uh, I was born in um, uh, near Calcutta. What is Calcutta, now, okay. Uh, yeah, in India. Okay. At that time, under the British. Wow, wow. So, okay, so how old were you around this time? So this is when you were much older, when you got into quantum physics, or? Oh, I was about, you know, what, uh, 16. When oh, I you're got... still young. Okay. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, in, in physics, you get, you get into the important stuff pretty early. <laughs> okay, cool, cool. You know, so, okay, so you wrote a, a book called God is Not Dead. And, you know, so let's, let's get straight into it. You know, Ken... Can the question of God's existence be settled by scientific evidence? So the first time I actually contacted you, I was telling you about, um, you know, we've had several guests on the show. Some of them were even atheists. We have theists, atheists, you know, and, and so that's why I was kind of wanting to show the other side, so to speak. And so you're actually our first uh, quantum physicist, which is exciting, you know. So, so can the question of God's existence be settled by scientific evidence, in your opinion? Is it turns out that if you ask the question correctly, it can. It of can. Course, uh, <laughs> mystics make it too mystical sometimes, saying God is ineffable and all that. Mm. So the ineffable God is not what I'm looking at. What okay. I'm looking at is a very simple thing. Science says that all, right now, scientific worldview is called scientific materialism, and it says that all causation come from material interaction. Right. In other words, causation is happening in space and time, via matter moving in space and time. Mm -hmm. And that's all phenomena. So if we can show simply that no causation exists from outside of space and time as well, then uh, we got it. Then we got a proof that there is some agency that is outside of space and time, but still affects what happens inside space and time. Mm -hmm. And that's what God is, basically. If you look at spiritual literature, when you get rid of all the mystical stuff, mysterious stuff, which right. I agree, cannot be penetrated very easily, you have to go through it. But the essence of what they're saying is that, look, there is not just this worldly affairs, but something outside of the space-time world that affects us also. And mm -hmm. we better be aware of it, how to get hold of that force that's not outside of us, it is potentially inside of us. If we can get hold of that force, our life will be better for it. This is the simple message of spiritual tradition. So they suggest that there are subtle experiences that we can count on, and if we count on the subtlest of the subtle, they come as spiritual values to us, like beauty, love, those things. And then if we follow these archetypes, as Plato called them, then 
will get to the source of it and then we'll take charge. We will realize that we have freedom to choose, we have freedom to create, and then we get to create our own reality. So hmm. it's as simple as that. But yeah. how to prove it depends crucially on the fact that there is a force, there is a source of change, there is an agent, creative agency outside of space and time, outside of material interactions. Okay. So so what is God? Because you're, you're calling it like a force. So I mean, so I mean, the question that I would frame it would it be like what is God or would it be appropriate to say who is God like like that the, you know the new science is rediscovering is it is it similar to the Christian God the Hindu God the Muslim God the Judaic God yeah that's where you get in trouble oh. <laughs> I'm invited the trouble in our discussion <laughs> yeah these gods are all um, somewhat personalized in various ways especially popularized in, uh, in Christianity in right. a way that everybody in the West can relate to but that God is a bearded white guy sitting on a throne in heaven. <laughs> and that's the picture that uh, you mentioned atheists. That's the picture that atheists really hate. Because right. that is so simplistic. Obviously, they say, in view of science, how can people continue to believe in such a simplistic model? Mm -hmm. I mean, if anything, God would not have a gender. If anything, God would not have a color. If right. anything, God would not have a beard versus non-beard. This kind of right, right really is disturbing. But sure. anyway, why do we do that? Because we make a model of God in terms of who we know are the wise people around ourselves. Mm -hmm. So the image was that this white bearded guy, and to me, you know, there was one white bearded guy that I respected uh, most of my life, Abraham Lincoln. So <laughs> that's such a bearded guy who are very respect respectable. And this may have a beard, I don't know. I respected him too. <laughs> St. Francis, I'm not at all sure he had a beard. Yeah. <laughs> there are people in the West who we can deeply respect, who are white and who are old, and uh, at least that's the image we remember. Right. So uh, the picture is not all that bad either. Mm -hmm. What you have to look at is the beyond the metaphor of the picture. For example, let's take Hindus. Mm -hmm. Hindus have, um, on one hand, the concept of no picture, like Judaism, mm. but on the other hand, they say, well, it's true, they don't know pictures, but it is good to make pictures, mm. so let's also have some pictures, but these are pictures of archetypes. Right. They don't uh, expressly state it like Plato, but they mean that, like say, sure. God of love. Sure. It's very clear that this God is not God. This sure. God is, represents love. Sure. So, sure. you know, when you read through the metaphor, then you get the right picture. Of course, science says everything is literal. Mm. Because of scientific invasion of the world, we have learned literalism, and this is how science, uh, religions have become fundamentalist. Now, they are also saying everything is literal. So you have to take Genesis literally, you have to take Hinduism literally, and mm. these groups are creating havoc because they their internal interpretation of their good books don't agree with other good books' literal interpretation. Right, and so right. things have become muddled. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, like, I, I know you're rejecting the idea of, uh, like, a white-bearded guy, you know, in the sky or, you know, has no color, no race or anything. But but is the God that you're proposing or the science is rediscovering, is it a personal God in the sense where you can have a relationship where you can talk to this kind of force or this God? Such a good question. This is where things get extremely complicated mm. because you have to be very careful about what we are talking about. So here, here is what quantum physics enables us to figure out, have something very new. Mm. Uh, something very new and yet the ancient mystics, they knew that, that it is like this because they had experienced this very new. So what is the very new? Very new the thing that we have discovered that uh, through quantum physics, quantum physics has, is a physics of possibility. Objects mm -hmm. are waves of possibility. This is the thing that people really have to understand and really uh, convince themselves that this implies that there is a domain of reality outside of space and time where these possibility waves reside. Because mm -hmm. these possibility waves, the communication in this domain, that domain is instantaneous. Instantaneous communication cannot happen in space and time. So space and time and this domain of potentiality, where communication is instantaneous, experimentally discovered, uh, they are two different domains. 
And that domain then can be very well called a domain of heaven, me me metaphorically, of course. Sure. You have is the domain of potentiality. So what converts the potentiality into actuality? That's the crucial question. Mm -hmm. A force is required, an interaction that is required, and now that we have the language of possibility, we, re we, we realize that, well, the interaction is nothing but choosing. Mm -hmm. You choose from possible outcomes a certain outcome. Mm -hmm. That's what uh, this force is all about. It's choice. Yeah. It's creative choice. You choose the new, and that's when God is in our life. So, mm -hmm. this also requires an embodiment that happens in our being, through our brain. Right. So there is an embodiment of God in us. Okay. And this embodiment in spiritual traditions are called by holy names, like in Christianity it's Holy Spirit, sure. in um, Hinduism it's Atman, in Judaism it's Ein Sof. And there are such names, holy names, in every religion. They yeah. all, mystics, all direct experience, known that yes, this being exists. And yeah. then, of course, the being gets transformed by memory, by the body's needs by our reactions to various stimuli, and we become the ego. Sure. So the the answer to your question is that this embodiment of God that comes to us, in quantum physics we call it the quantum self, mm. instead of the Holy Spirit or Atman or, you know, the, the, the religious sounding names. Mm. We call it quantum self. No, no argument here. It's an objective experience. Anybody can have it if you do certain things, follow a process. And so this quantum self is the closest we can come as experience to God. Mm -hmm. So this is the personal God that literature is full of. The, you can develop a relationship with this God. You can flow with this God to write a novel, a poetry. Musicians do that regularly in their jazz sessions. Basketball players do it mm -hmm. when they're in the zone. So this is the God that that really we pray, this is the God that we want with us all the time, this is the personal God. But mm -hmm. it's not God the Father that Jesus talks about. Okay. Okay, so that, that, that's a big thing um, for a lot of um, some of my listeners who believe that God is a Father. You know, because um, I, I guess what I was trying to get at is like, like for instance, I'm, I'm by myself at home. And so if we talk about like, is it the is there's like different levels of reality and communication as you're talking about. So is this quantum self or this God within, is this just a more of a belief in yourself or is it me like talking to, like if I just say, oh God, I need your help right now. Where he's as if he's like another person, you know what I mean? Or do, is it more of a, an awakening to myself of potentiality in that sense of believing in God? Yeah. It's uh, the last one is pretty close. So oh, okay. Yeah, stay with that, and let me just say what the process when we say things like, "Oh God, I need you now." Yeah, <laughs> is that there is? Um, there, I mentioned before there are certain things, the archetypes, which connect us to God. Sure. Similarly, there are certain things which takes us away from God. Okay. And the biggest of these things is fear. Mm -hmm. So when fear grapples us, we are in the middle of insecurity, feeling that I don't have any sure ground under my foot. Oh God, help me. Yeah, trying out to restore me in my normal conditions out of fear so, so that I can connect with you again. This is the time when you lose the connection. We know that we have lost the connection and we want the connection back. So we pray to let us rid of the fear and get the connection back. Yeah, but That's why we pray and it's a very appropriate reaction. It's extremely appropriate reaction for a human being to reach out to God in those moments because God's name if you don't utter it regularly in vain, this is why God's name is not supposed to be uttered in vain, because mm -hmm. then it has become routine. It does not mm -hmm. have that force of intention behind it when you reach out to God. Mm -hmm. So if you don't utter the name of God in heaven, if uh, in vain, if, if you are serious about God, then what happens is that you recover from that fear and you are back to normalcy again. You are mm -hmm. back to love again. And that's oh, what okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's let's get to this issue of reality, though. You know, so uh, you know, I've had guests on the show who just they just believe that the world is just it's a physical world. It's just a material world. I mean, so just to respond to that, you know, don't we just live in a material world as many skeptics claim? So there's really no you know other forces or invisible realities out there, so to speak. 
Yeah, well, the, the question you should frame is not that way. Let me reframe your question a little bit. Uh, the, the question is not that there is not another world, because quantum physics has settled that. Okay. Quantum physics has settled once and for all that there are two domains of reality. There is a heaven, mm. metaphorically. It's a domain of potentiality where com can communicate with infinite speed instantly. There is just one thing. That's what happens in that world. So that oneness that mystics talk about, we have discovered that in quantum physics. There is no question about it. So the question really is that why then so many people become are living in this one space-time world, completely oblivious about this other world. They call themselves atheists. Mm. And um, they seem to be quite happy, quite adjusted, you know, uh, like comedian Bill Maher. I <laughs> like it so. I yeah, regularly yeah. watch it. But he's, he, he says, he says that he's an atheist. Um, yeah. I don't, but, but he said, and I'll take his word for it. Uh, I have to take his word seriously. <laughs> right. So why does he pretend or maybe seriously live as an atheist? That is the mm. question. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, uh, probably he doesn't know about quantum physics. He probably mm -hmm. has heard about it. That's the, this is the one sad thing. This is why I have a movement called quantum activism. I want people to be aware that quantum physics has settled this question. There is mm -hmm. no question that there is another domain of reality where there is oneness. You can call the oneness God, where there is a force which consists of choosing from possibility. So that question is settled already. Mm -hmm. The question that is very disturbing to us is that is it possible to live in this space-time world without paying attention to this other world? Mm. And the answer, unfortunately, yes, is yes, it is possible. But yeah. this is what happens if we do it. The, what happens is that, okay, we are beings who are the result of a long evolution. We have to go through from one cell to multiple cells to invertebrates to vertebrates to mammals to primates to finally mm. reach human. And as human beings, we have this ability to think, we have the ability to feel, we have a self and all these things. Mm -hmm. This is peculiarly human. The other beings, well, chimpanzees come a little bit close, but nothing really close to a human being. With, a, with an ego, with creativity, mm. with a capacity to um, think creatively, new meaning, feel. So these are typically human beings. And then if we leave out the heavenly stuff, what happens is that we are a product of the evolution and we are a product of the upbringing in our culture. We are a product of society and we are also a product of the genes. Hmm. So these are the three sources then of our uh, being. What happens then? Well, evolution has given us some negative emotional brain circuits. Sociobiologists talk about it. This is where, from how, where all these fighting tendencies. First thing, somebody does something bad, our tendency is, oh, let's kill them, let's mm. fight. Yeah. And that tendency comes because we have a brain circuit built into us. If we don't pay attention, then we'll always be fighting with somebody else because somebody is always doing wrong. Because we pay some attention, we have developed laws and society which does not permit for you to become so agitated because somebody else has done something wrong for you in retaliation to do something wrong to somebody else again. Yeah, yeah. And this is, of course, what perpetuates in our society to some extent. And this is why so much violence in America, because people decide, oh, somebody else is doing wrong somewhere else. So I must retaliate by doing some something wrong here. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. No reason, but that's how they feel. Sure. So it's coming from these brain circuits. This is the important point. And the whole religion, mystical traditions arose because people notice that there is something we can do about it. If we are aware of this heavenly stuff, the archetypes, the gods of love and justice and mm -hmm. goodness, if we discover those archetypes, then we can change we can develop positive emotional brain circuits which will balance out the negative in us. And that's the only way that society can uh, grow. Mm. Civilization is a result of this knowing or unknowing. We have developed some awareness of that we can do without the negative emotional brain circuit. This is why we have created the laws. Don't think that the laws came from the sky. Laws didn't. <laughs> 
we created them. How yeah. did we create them? We looked at religions, we saw that there is a reasonable amount of success, that we can actually suppress some of these emotions. You know, 100 years ago, anybody could go to Texas and be killed. Anybody who does mm -hmm. not have a gun, who does not have the structure to use a gun, uh, would be killed in a matter of moments. If you mm -hmm. tell anybody who is bigger than you and has a gun that they can well better, you will be killed. Yeah. No longer happens. Yeah. No longer happens. Maximum they can do, they can exclude you from a bathroom. No big deal. Mm. I have been excluded from a bathroom, but I don't particularly care. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Um, so, uh, this is a huge improvement, right? I right. didn't feel it. Right, so, right. Um, uh, I think that this is the kind of thing that has depended on the religions and, pro and about the spiritual traditions, and we should not throw them away. We should look at it seriously. That is it our lot that we live with these negative emotions? Is it our lot that we live like Pavlovian dogs, always salivating whenever the condition stimulus comes in our view? Uh, or is there any better life? Yeah. Religion yeah. and spirituality is not about finding this bearded guy or mm. living with him if I surrender to him so-called and, and die and then I, I go and live in his lap. Mm. No, that's not really what it's about. What it's about is to combating these negative tendencies, what some people call evil, mm. and combat them with good, developing good in us. And mm. then we can live a better life. Yeah. Life becomes better right. when you don't have the violence in you, when you don't have the competitiveness in you. Now, what is the life of this fellow who just killed these fellows, the mm. killed 14 people? What is the life uh, of the pe person who can create a rampage in the uh, Planned Parenthood of his right. other? Right. What, they just imagine their life. I cannot mm. help, you know, I uh, have developed a little capacity of empathizing with people like that. Yeah. But I, I feel it's just sad, immensely sad, that they have misled people torn yeah. by the worldview difference that exists today between Christianity and science, hmm. torn by it and cannot make a decision of what is good and what is not. And then they do things, and, and we should not do anything to instigate these guys to make to feel that killing somebody else is okay. Right. We also have to give them some medicine, we have to give them something to hold on to, and this is why religion can really help. Yeah. Religion in the right form, not in the literal form, Right. Religion which can say not literally what you have to do, because the literal stuff is pretty bad. Hmm. Thou shalt not kill has been said literally, but literally understanding it is not doing anything <laughs> to these people. They are still killing. Right, so what right. you have to understand what does it mean to say thou shalt not kill. You mm -hmm. have to make it clear. Thou shalt not kill, instead thou shalt learn to love. Hmm. And that thou shalt learn to love part, if you omit that, then thou shalt not kill is a meaningless, meaningless commandment. Right, that right. cannot be obeyed without having love in your brain, without having a love circuit in your brain that will come to your rescue, which wants to kill, which has been agitated. You right. See? right, right. Yeah, so definitely, as you were mentioning, like a lot's changed, you know, I mean, just with, with the violence and, or even racism, a lot's changed because we're, we're evolving. Um, you know, of course, we still have some stuff that what we would call evil today still going on, but things have definitely changed. And so, but I'd like to touch on the whole idea of of evolution, though. Uh, you know, doesn't doesn't that kind of demonstrate though that there's no need for God, as a lot of people claim? Well, initially, it certainly did. You know, people like Darwin and Herbert Spencer—they are not stupid people. They were yeah. very intelligent people. And indeed, they saw, especially for Darwin, it was, he was torn between religion and science. Hmm. But eventually, he voted for science because he realized that um, religion has done, you know, has gotten a state where changes are needed. So, uh, he created his theory, uh, stopgap theory as it was. It was not a complete theory. He knew it. But unfortunately, his followers uh, took it upon themselves to make it a pretensive complex, complete theory, and that has caused a lot of harm in our society. But no, why is it not a complete theory? Because it really does not answer the data completely. And now a lot of controversies in biology itself, you know, I, I contribute to a biology sort of newsletter kind of forum right now. I'm part of it, and part of it meaning that they send me regular letters. Yeah. And there's a lot of controversy among biologists themselves about this, uh, how reliable 
is the data right. uh, that Darwinism is based. Right. Especially uh, with the fossil gaps. Fossil gaps and yeah. arrow of time, that's another one why life evolves towards complexity. Darwinism has no answer for that and, and even other things. I wrote a book about it called Creative Evolution. Mm -hmm. God is not dead has a chapter on evolution. Um, right, right. Uh, so, uh, these things are very, very important to recognize because Darwinism does show initially to a lot of people that uh, since monkeys are largely machines, and that cannot be that cannot be debated. Monkeys are largely machines. I mean, largely because there is a living component in it in monkeys, and they have some cognition. So it's not completely machine. Machines have no subject-object experience at all. Uh, monkeys have some ideas of uh, subjectivity. Mm. Uh, so it's not entirely machine-like, but almost machine-like. So mm. when Darwin claimed that we evolved from monkeys, naturally the assumption is, um, assumption came that we are also machines, like yeah. animals. So that's, that's a natural conclusion. Scientists cannot be blamed for making a natural conclusion which seemed appropriate at that time. At that time, yeah. So 19th century. 1857 right. was the year in which Darwin published his book. Right, right. Now it's 21st century. We have 150 years gone by. We have learned quantum physics in the meantime. We have learned enormous amount about the world and enormously large number of people today are going for transformation. They're everywhere. It's not mm -hmm. just me crying out that, look, listen to quantum physics. Mm -hmm. The message that we can change, we can transform, we don't have to kill, we can overcome violence, we can love. This message is given, you can find so many people to talk about this message, Joshua. There's no mm -hmm. question. It's not just religion anymore. Scientists like me are talking about this. Yeah. So there is really reality in transformation. We can change. And right. we have to approach the problem of terrorism, problem of violence, which is currently occupying us the most, because violence also large scale, Syria, that's a major problem. All this problem, this new dimension has to be brought in, the spiritual dimension. Yeah. Then only we'll approach them correctly. Currently, there is just that violence must be treated with violence. This approach is the only approach that people are listening to. To his credit, Obama, mm -hmm. Obama is kind of in the middle. So right. he's exactly listening to them. We are very fortunate as Americans that he is not. But if you leave it up to Donald Trump, there will be war in Syria the next day. And uh. it will refer it to a third world war. Yeah. So uh, this is the situation we are living in. So quantum message, and this is why I thank you for presenting me to your audience, but the message is urgent. It not only has to happen and eventually will happen, but it needs to happen urgently as yeah. as possible. Right, right. No, I mean, that's that's one of the reasons why I I wanted you on the show because, like, when I read your book a couple of years ago, I was like, I, I really appreciated the message and, you know, just even you identifying yourself as a quantum activist. Like, you want to see these things done and played out in our lives and having these divine qualities, so to speak, as you describe in your book. And, um, you know, because just throughout the years, you know, my own experience and the experience of other people, our understanding of spirituality and of God really does make a difference in our lives. You know, so when I would see people who believe in a, you know, in, in, a, in a violent and judgmental God, they end up becoming that God that, <laughs> that they believe in, you know. So throughout the years, I've been having to kind of unlearn and and. Um, just kind of evaluate, you know, what 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 kind of God am I believing in? Because I'm starting to look like, you know, quote unquote Him, you know. Right. And so the more I started to discover a, a God that was more universal, if you want to call it that, and more uh, more embracing of of just of all, uh, that's when things started to change dramatically in my own life, you know. And just coming from Christianity and reading up a lot on different types of religions and spirituality books and and you know just reading you know because I, I would always wonder too like okay if i move away from the god of traditional or evangelical christianity you know I, am i going to get into this god who's very impersonal where he's just he's just a force that do i even talk to him anymore because it doesn't feel because my whole life i've always spoken out loud you know to god quote unquote you know when i'm a since i was a child you know, and so that's why I've been on this this journey of, of like learning and then coming to pretty much the conclusions that that uh, 
you write in your book, you know, out of the, the several guests that I've had on my show, a lot of times I have guests on my show, I don't really agree with their stuff, but I, I like them to come on because they're part of my, my journey. You know, but when I read your book, your book is like probably one of the closest ones I could say, yeah, this is what I what I'm starting to believe now. Uh, this kind of God, you know, or as you were mentioning, like the the, the quantum self, you know, about, about this kind of awakening and God is in us and everywhere. And, um, you know, that's that's why I really appreciate that, you know, and but but one of the things that I noticed, too, which is um, really interesting is that although you believe in the existence of God, you're still very critical of. Uh, biblical creationism and intelligent design. So, why is that for my listeners? Well, I'm not. I'm not very critical. Uh, if you read my book on evolution, creative evolution, you will find that the first chapter is devoted in showing that there is some basic truth in creationism and intelligent design. Mm -hmm. Those words, of course, aggravate the scientists. Right. So, in fact, presenting the book that way, I made a mistake because you know scientists don't touch it because it seems like I'm trying to um, mitigate between creationism and science, and that mm. cannot be done. I agree with science there, actually. Sure, sure. But the scientists are too allergic to the word intelligent design, and that should not be. Because <laughs> right. it's very clear from the data, just as it is very clear from the data that we came from monkeys, similarly, yeah. it is also very clear from the data that there is purposiveness in evolution, that uh, evolution really does proceed from simple to complex. It is a fact that we began as a single cell, and look at us now, we are very complex human beings. So this suggests a purposiveness that just cannot be denied. Darwin saw it very clearly, but his followers more and more because they follow a scientific materialistic philosophy, because of philosophical prejudice, they have rejected the idea of purpose. Sure. But quantum physics allows us to reintroduce purpose in the theory. Because if you look at the mechanism that I just suggested, consciousness chooses from the possibilities, the actual events of our experience, then you immediately say, okay, so how do I make that choice objective? Hmm. You can make the choice objective if, only if you can assume, or rather one way of making it objective is to assume that evolution has purpose. And this is simply, this is the simplest way. Assume that evolution has purpose. What is the purpose of evolution? To make us better and better representer of consciousness. Hmm. That means that we represent what the potentialities of consciousness are. So the potentiality right. not only to sense the matter, material objects, but also to feel vital objects, to think mental objects, meaning, and then ultimately these archetypes. Mm -hmm. to change ourselves with these archetypes like love, beauty, right. just truth, and all that. Right. So when we do that, that's the highest, as far as you can tell right now, that's the highest goal of evolution. So, mm -hmm. so all, the, all the events of transforming possibilities into actuality are geared to making this happen. So you right. can easily introduce this purpose in this theory, then this theory becomes totally objective, and we recognize that there is a role of purpose in our life, mm -hmm. and the whole theory of human being changes. Mm -hmm. As soon as you have introduced purpose, you can really say it with some truth that, look, violence is not the way because it's taking us away from purpose. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, if you say within Darwinism, then dog is dog, uh, right. everything because it's survival of the fittest. So that right. has contributed, the scientific insistence on Darwinism has contributed greatly in why we have so much violence in society. Yeah. Because that yeah. suggests that we are not capable of doing anything about our competitive nature, about our violent nature, about establishing our superiority over the meek and the weak. But yeah. this is not the way religion saw it. Jesus had thousands of statements thrown in the New Testament which suggest that take care of the meek and the weak because they are important. Yeah. Yeah. And and today we just forget that. Might right. is right has become once in a way, once again, you know, might now is of course not physical might, it's might of money. But uh, why is Donald Trump so popular in the Republican Party? Because right. he has money, he has the image that he can make things done to make the money. Right. Therefore, uh, he should be voted for as the president, as uh, the decider of such things as war and peace. And mm -hmm. this is dangerous. Yeah. No, I, I like the fact that you you mentioned about how there's this uh, this objective purpose in it all because 
you know, sometimes um, I, I receive messages from people or, you know, some of my listeners or I meet up with some people and they'll, they'll tell me because they're moving away from from the religion that they grew up with, it's been hard to find meaning again, you know, because for them before growing up with meaning is like, you know, okay, I'm going to follow Jesus and live out the purposes that they try to get out from the Bible. And then when they move away from religion, it, you know, especially because we live in a, like a postmodern culture, it's like, they, they, they have a hard time figuring out what's like what's objectively true now. So they would just default and say, well, maybe there's no real meaning anymore. I just have to create it. But it's just not as motivating because, you know, you kind of create it yourself. But <laughs> then again, it's like a doggy dog, wor- you know, doggy dog world. And, you know, everyone's just trying to survive. So it's it's not as uh, motivating for some of the people that I've, I've right. communicated with. So just you mentioning that there's this purpose evolution to make us to become better and better. Uh, I guess more more aware, I guess we can say, and just, um, you know, getting rid of violence. I'm sorry? Let me come to the question of meaning. Okay. What has happened under scientific materialism is that they have, through the success of communication technology, convinced an entire generation, the people who are called millennials. I don't know what your age is, Joshua. Yeah, I'm a not... millennial. <laughs> I'm 34, yeah. 34, you are a millennial. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the millennials are in a terrible, terrible, terrible situation because they have been convinced by these um, scientific materialist guys that um, the world is information. There is no meaning. It all can be digitalized. I mean, digitalization is extremely wonderful uh, technological development. I enjoy it because it enables me to process information quickly and Mm. softwares improve and all that. But to replace meaning by information is a terrible undermining of the human being. They're just saying that human beings are nothing like machines, uh, nothing but machines. Machines have to be stuck with information because machines cannot process meaning. That's not a capacity machines have. So, but we today we imagine, we automatically imagine, look at television shows, look at the movies that are being made right now. We, are, we imagine that machines are the future. We right. are going to become more machine-like and machines are going to take over because machines are obviously better machines than we can ever be. Right. And this is a dilemma that all millennials have to live through. Mm. So what is the answer? The answer is, yes, there is meaning because we have mind, which is, right, not, right. Which is independent of matter. Right. And this mind consciousness uses to process meaning. What else? Exactly. Meaning yeah. is represented in information processing, processing capacity that machines have, that, that has made us better. Indeed, machines are very useful to us. So to we guide machines to process our meaning. Hmm. I write my books with the help of a word processor. I'm using right. the machine to process my meaning. But right. never get the idea that machine is writing the ideas of what <laughs> right. that I write. Right. Machine cannot originate meaning. Machine right. cannot deal with meaning. Sure. So when we think that we are machine and nothing but machines, we forget about the meaning world, and that's the danger. That's right. the even more dangerous than being violent. Right, right. So what has surreptitiously happened to the youth of our society, hmm. and frankly, I think the educating, re-educating them back is the biggest challenge. And today, I I, present, I um, spend a lot of time thinking about how to help the youth, how to, hmm. my uh, Facebook uh, fanship is largely made up young people, and I'm very grateful hmm. for it, that, that I have an opportunity to affect some of their lives. Hmm. And I want to make the point, not only that meaning is important, but meaning at its highest comes from giving meaning to the archetypes. Yeah. So when a meaning, our meaning exploration is used creatively to explore the archetypes, then we are at our best. Yeah. And this is what every young person should aim for. This is the role of spirituality. Religions mm. have stopped that role, religions have forgotten that role, and this is the reason for demise of religion. Should we support the demise of religion? Well, if religions continue in this way, then uh, there is no other alternative. But right. I think that the religions are ready to change, especially uh, religions like Christianity. I think yeah. there is a movement, at least in America, I can see the movement of change yeah. among Christians. They are ready to leave the old-fashioned uh, Christianity superior than all other religions. And <laughs> have to do yeah. 
and the two Jesus and Jesus saves and yeah. all that um, evangelical fundamentalist interpretation, I think, are giving right. way to a new awakening. I mean, right. there are books by Christians right. written now that, you know, a book is called Thank God for Evolution. Can you right. believe it? <laughs> fundamentalists are against evolution. Yeah. And I has written a bestseller called Thank God for Evolution. <laughs> So right, understanding right. that evolution proves God rather than the other way around. Yeah, yeah. No, no. You're doing a great job. Like I said, your your work has affected you know me personally, and I mean, because for me, when I was moving away from um, actually when I was more traditional as a, as a you know fundamentalist Christian evangelical, I I studied a lot of um, about the f- consciousness, you know, the philosophy of mind. And so that was actually one of the areas that I wanted to study in and, and hopefully become an expert in in the future, like at that time when I was really into studying philosophy. And so I was like really aware of a lot of the arguments from consciousness uh, for the reality of, of, of God and, mater- you know, th- uh, realities other than materialism. But then I started to kind of like move away from um, my traditional faith, started reading a lot on, you know, liberal theology, atheism. And of course, they always just a lot of its default is just uh, evolution without God and materialism, you know, but I've always remembered the whole idea of, of consciousness. And when I would read the skeptical books that I own, I, I, just, I just wouldn't buy into many of the arguments I would say, because it was, it, it just didn't make sense to me to just manipulate matter and then consciousness is produced. And so when I would read your book, you know, when I read your book, it just really confirmed a lot of the things that I, that I studied back in the day of just, of consciousness, <laughs> you know, but, that there's this different kind of reality that we have other than just this material world. And, and so I, you know, I'm just applauding you for your work. Like it's, it's really brought together some of the things that I, I studied in the past. And when I started to kind of, you know, doubt some of my own uh, beliefs growing up as a fundamentalist Christian. And, and, you know, one of the things that I really loved about your book was a, was a section about the fossil data, you know, because you talk about how it actually supports the idea of God's existence. In fact, you say it's one, some of the best proof for yeah. God's existence and creativity. Yeah. So can yeah. you kind of uh, go into that? Well, um, here's the thing. You know, even Darwin noticed that, uh, look, to produce something like a new organ, take a look at the eye. So, you know, Darwin says things happen because uh, genes have mutations and then nature selects out of these mutations the mutations that would be beneficial. It sounds a wonderful mechanism that can produce change in one, from one species to another. But you look at the details, it falls apart. Hmm. Why? Because most mutations are harmful mutations. They're not beneficial for the survival of the, pers- uh, of the uh, species. Therefore, they are rejected by nature, by, according to Darwin. The theory itself rejects it. So how would thousands upon thousands of mutations that are needed to produce a new organ for example, uh, a, an animal which does not see, and then you develop an eye, primitive eye though it is, but mm-hmm. even that takes a thousands upon thousands of mutations to produce that eye. It's not a single mutation that can mm-hmm. do it. It's mm-hmm. just not possible. It just cannot happen that way. Yeah. So details just do not pan out, because how would these thousands of mutations, if most of them are harmful, will, will be sil- not be selected against during the millions of years that it takes to accumulate them. They will be obviously selected against according to Darwin's own assumption. So mutation just cannot grow upon themselves until there is a benefit. The mm. benefits take a long time to to see. One thousandth of an eye is no good. It has right. no benefit. This is the point that even Darwin pointed out in his book. He was very concerned that there is this basic weakness in the theory. So how does quantum physics solve it? Quantum physics solve it simply by saying that, look, everything is, remains in possibility until there is manifestation. Mm-hmm. And when is manifestation? When there is usefulness for the animal from the accumulated possibilities. So things remain in possible, possibility. These mutations are possibilities. So until all the possibilities add up to the, that primitive eye, consciousness does not select. Consciousness does not choose. It's not nature that selects. It's consciousness that selects. Consciousness chooses. Mm -hmm. So consciousness chooses then. Natural selection comes later. After consciousness has chosen, yes, the the organisms certainly have to adjust to changes of nature. 
and that of course also exists and that's a secondary process but the primary process of speciation is not this darwinian continuous mechanism but a mechanism of change through conscious intervention and these changes happen drastically dramatically discontinuously they are called quantum leaps right right and this is the this is why it is it is the proof of god more than anything else because this discontinuous change cannot be the result of material interaction material right. interactions work only in a continuous way right and this so, takes no time these quantum that leaps is a right. discontinuous agent like right. god involved right right no that that's that's very uh, insightful <laughs> when i read that i was like wow you know and and, and so but you know when we talk about these these this whole idea of God, though, you know, how do we know it's not just some sort of brain phenomenon, right? Like it's like an emergent epiphenomenon of the brain. What if it's just an adaptation that we well, have? As I said, as I said, brain itself is a possibility of consciousness to choose from. So to, to quantum physics excludes this kind of thinking. If you assume that brain makes consciousness, then you get into the simple problem of how a measurement can ever happen. Sure. Think about it for a second. Our picture is that elementary particles make atoms, make molecules, make these uh, neurons, and then neurons make brain, right? And brain makes yeah. consciousness. But then all of this is impossibility. Quantum physics says possible elementary particles make possible atoms, make possible molecules, make possible neurons, make possible brain, and that can only make possible consciousness. Hmm. So then, how do we explain the fact that we look and we don't see possibility, we see actuality. Hmm. We actually see something moving in space and time when we look. Right? Yeah, right, right. It's not there, suddenly appears in the Geiger counter and we hear a tick. Huh. So as soon as the observer is there, possibility is transformed into actuality. Hmm. And this, if it were a possible consciousness, then how can that happen? Possible consciousness looking at a possible <laughs> right, through a right. Geiger counter is just a possibility. It never uh, happened. For actuality to happen, we need a force from outside of the domain of space and time. Hmm. This is the point. And that happens because consciousness chooses out of the possible positions of the electrons, that particular position where a given Geiger counter is detecting it. Right, this right. is the mystery of quantum measurement. So this forever yes. excludes all of this talk about brain making consciousness. Right. Aside from that, there are very good philosophical reasons too. Like we have subjective experience, brain is made of objects. Objects can never accumulate together and make a subject. Right. Objects only right. can make an object. Mm -hmm. So if brain was the answer, then the subject that we experience would be a meaningless phenomenon. Hmm. But is it meaningless phenomenon? If it were meaningless, then how could we ever change? This is why scientific materialists insist that all changes are illusory, that people don't really make change, they just lie about themselves. Okay, so if, did Mother Teresa lie? Did Gandhi lie? Fine, mm -hmm. I mean, you can hold on to that belief that they lied and things just happened. Okay. You are just able to do things their way, which is good, which mm -hmm. is against the evil of what they uh, opposed against, what they worked against. If you want to continue that belief that all the good that happens in society is just mirror, just illusion, hmm. you can. I mean, you are, of course, we live in a democratic society. I'm not going to stop you from talking anything, you know. Right. For me, it's totally liberal. I believe in free speech. Sure. You can hold any beliefs you like. Yeah. I will do my best to change your beliefs. I'll present the data, but I'll yeah. never force you to believe in my belief. That's sure. basic physics. It sure. believes in the creative ability of people you have and I have to discover the truth for ourselves. Sure. You don't have to listen to anybody else's truth to discover the truth in yourself. But you mm -hmm. have to realize that you have the capacity to discover the truth. So my appeal to people of that ilk, you know, uh, Raj Limbaugh, is just simply that, look, you have every right to preach what you preach, that's fine, but I wish that you had a more open mind so that you could discover the truth for yourself. Hmm, hmm. Right, right. So uh, it seems like, you know, just our, in our day and age, the way we're understanding quantum physics, it's it's helping us to understand a lot of things now. But, but how do you respond to a critic who says that quantum physics only applies to the micro and not necessarily to the macro world? So, so this, is, this is the biggest uh, lie that is being created by scientific materialists. 
that question applies to when we try to talk about the observer effect, observer effect the way I just did, measurement. Right. Mm -hmm. right. I agree that observer is a macro object and at macro level, the, uh, it, it is a fairly good assumption, not perfect, but right. a reasonable assumption to say that objects become approximately Newtonians. But that's not the issue about the why the spiritual, why the other domain of reality has to be included. That's built into the basic construction of quantum physics. That has nothing to do with micro-macro. It's built into the whole mechanics of quantum physics. Hmm. Quantum physics is saying objects have potentialities for, and, and, and these potentialities move in a domain which has absolute uh, infinite speed. Hmm. Uh, communication is instantaneous. This is the basic thing of quantum physics. From the get-go, from the equation itself, it's saying that there are two domains of reality. In one domain, communication moves instantaneously. We have proven now that experimentally. It's called non-locality. And the other domain, space-time, is local, where communication moves with a finite speed, very high speed, speed of light, but still finite speed. Whereas this other domain, has infinite speed of communication. And that's what makes it special, that's what makes it one, and that's where all this uh, new stuff that we are talking about come from. That is mm -hmm. not subject to the argument about quantum measurement. This is into the basics of quantum physics has been verified from all the basic experiments, like double slit. It right. can, double slit cannot be explained without assuming that there is this domain of potentiality in which waves of possibilities reside. That is mm -hmm. not a domain of space and time. Hmm. So, so there is just no question that people, these people are just creating, you know, in ancient times we have those sophists in Greece, hmm. they created arguments to fool people, and hmm. these, these people are no, uh, no better than the sophists. They know hmm. very well that this kind of thing is part and parcel of quantum worldview, but still they deny it by giving um, arguments which sounds good, to the uninitiated. Mm. But every initiated should know that this is not true. Quantum mm. physics, the quantum worldview changes Newtonian physics fundamentally. Newtonian physics cannot stand up. Scientific materialism is wrong, period. Yeah, yeah. Might macro that those arguments do not apply to this basic situation. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, when I would read or hear some lectures from people who are skeptics, they would talk about it only refers just to the micro world. And I like how in your book you were talking about how quantum physics is actually the, the, the basis of our understanding of large objects like stars and galaxies and cosmological events. And Also that, also that. Yeah. But quite sophistication, but you say I don't even bring, need to bring that up. Hmm. I don't need to bring up the idea that quantum cosmology is essential to understand cosmology itself. But but the point is that the basic structure of quantum physics is suggesting that Newtonian world physics, Newtonian worldview, just does not hold water. Yeah. Hmm. So what what are some of the the, the questions that materialists can't answer? So you talked about meaning before. What what are some other things that the materialists can't answer? Questions. Human cannot answer. Yeah. Materialists cannot answer meaning, materialists cannot get purpose in their uh, theories. This is why materialist theories are machine theory. Mm -hmm. They cannot get meaning, purpose, these are very major shortcomings. They cannot get the idea that human beings um, have scope for mythology in their life. They mm -hmm. cannot understand that and therefore they reject it. They cannot understand free will and creativity, that's a major shortcoming. This is why they say that we cannot change, we are stuck by our violent nature. All we can do is to make laws, but look, even the laws suggest that, of course, then we have some idea of where, why we need yeah. to change, right? If we didn't know why we need to change, why should we make laws? Let it be sure. violent, it be that way, if that is our nature. But we do that because we know in our heart that this is not the way, we can change. Yeah. And, and so many people have changed and still this myth hangs on that we cannot change, it's just deplorable that scientific materialists believe in that myth of no change, no change is possible, in yeah. spite of the fact that so many people, we know from, from psychotherapy literature, that so many people have changed from the lowest level of awareness where criminals are, psychopathology is of course, yeah. uh, you know, shows itself in schizophrenic, sociopaths, psychopaths, sure. lowest level of awareness, but people 
can change from that to higher levels of awareness sure. to normalcy. Most people are actually normal, and then to even positive mental health. Uh, since that concept came around from the 60s, yeah. we now absolutely have produced millions, millions of one fifth of Americans are uh, pretty uh, positive mental health people. Mm -hmm. They have mm -hmm. positive mental health. So, yeah. how did they change? How did they change? Yeah. Yes, we have the fundamentalists, we have the scientific materialists who want to hold on to their negativity. But the fact is that we have a very large number of people who have worked up to positive, including you, Joshua. Yeah. You are only 34. You already are uh, looking into a positive outlook of life. Hmm. And this is the future. This is the hope that yeah. only this 25%, 20% will become large enough to make a difference in the political uh, scenario. And as they do, look out. Look out, America. You <laughs> change from this violence today. Yeah. I'm not particularly against gun laws. I don't think Sorry. that's what the crucial point is, I wish that there were no guns in this society, hmm. but in, in essence, if we change towards positivity, yeah. guns will be per se anyway. Nobody will use guns for violence. And I agree that people who use guns for hunting, they are not violent people necessarily. Hmm. Yeah, no, no, I, I appreciate you. I mean, of course, you're, you're one of the guys out there that's like a foreigner, you know, passing this message on to us, you know. and. And I, I think you might have answered this question already, but I'm just trying to think of what would you say to someone, um, like if I were an atheist or an agnostic, and I would say, okay, you know, you're talking that um, we can't answer meaning and all these things, but but I have meaning. I you know I have meaning without God, or or even if um, you know love, because I think you mentioned that love is even a divine quality. I, I can love as an atheist. So how, how would you respond to someone saying that? Though? Well, that's fine. I, the, the, the response yeah. to that, look, you're already waking up partly. Okay. And to wake up fully, what you'll find is that your, your free will to love, your free will to meaning as you're expressing it. By the way, I wanted to correct one thing. I am an American citizen. Oh, okay. So, not a <laughs> so uh, anyway, um, uh, you are already living partially the uh, truth of quantum uh, living. Uh, when you wake up fully to your creativity, you will notice that your creativity is coming from a source right. that is seemingly outside of your ego. Mm -hmm. At that point, you will inquire, what is this being that is coming to me while I'm creative? And then you will see the rest of what I'm saying, mm -hmm. the rest of the interpretation of quantum physics, where that enters. But right. I, say, I would say, all power to you, stick yeah. to those meanings, stick to the purpose, you will sooner or later discover your quantum meaning, quantum life, quantum being, and your life will only be better for it. Yeah. It's it so much better, you have no idea. Yeah. Please enter this new way of living. Right, it's right. Mm -hmm. Now, now, now uh, you know, so our old, our old science tells us that, you know, what's real is a material universe, and our brains are material, and that our experiences are our egos, and God is just like a brain phenomenon, etc., and, and mystics, are the ones that say God is real, but that uh, the manifest world is unreal. And the, and the popular version of Christianity that I grew up with says that both the material universe and God are real, but they're separate entities. But uh, would you, because I was taught that we were separated from God ever since, you know, like even when I was born, that's just what I was taught, you know, until I placed my faith in Jesus. What do you have to say about that? Like, are we separate from God? We are never separate from God. Okay, even prior and to believing forget, in Jesus? <laughs> we have deep forgetfulness. Hmm. We forget, and sometimes the apparent separation becomes very great when we are in the feet of fear. If we could eliminate fear and insecurity uh, from our life, we would feel the connection much better. Somebody okay. uh, gave us a beautiful praise, love is letting go of fear. I hmm. love that statement. If we could go, let go of fear. The fundamentalists, some of them are the most fearful people. Atheists, yeah. some of them are the most fearful people. Yeah. And because they are fearful, they are rejecting this wholeness that exists in the core of their being. Right. If they discover the wholeness, how does that threaten us? Yet the mystics gave us unfortunate impression that leave the world because the world is illusion. Hmm. That certainly can be misinterpreted in a lot of ways. The best mystics did not mean illusion as illusion. They just mm -hmm. meant that it has an illusory component of it because sure. it hides the reality. Sure. That, hit, uh, that ability to camouflage reality is an illusion. Hmm. 
Hmm. Reality is always there. Like uh, to, your, um, to your question and answer unequivocally, we are never separate from yeah. God. That's the reality. Right. But there is an illusion to think that, yes, I am separate from God. And that illusion is part of the camouflage. Sure. God created us this way. This is the way consciousness created us. So we cannot complain. These laws of the universe in such a way that there will be a camouflage that we have to penetrate. Yeah. In other words, we have to we have to go through a test of sorts. Sure. sure. Otherwise, we are stuck. But any intelligent person, and we are today, you know, lots of uh, lots and lots of us are born with enough intelligence to penetrate this camouflage. Yeah. Lots and lots. I mean, mm -hmm. really, literally, uh, out of. Um, Seven billion people. Right. I would say maybe even more than a billion can yeah. penetrate this camouflage today. Yeah. So, uh, so if this, if there is this camouflage, or you know, if there is this illusion of, of separation, and we're not separated from God, is it appropriate to say that we are God? Yeah, absolutely. It's completely okay. appropriate to say. But if you say it prematurely, then sure. it will produce megalomania, and then then <laughs> another Donald another you know, <laughs> megalomaniac will come into the picture. So it's not sure. good to use it frivolously. No, 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 no. I know for sure. That, it's just when I read it in your book, it, it makes sense to me. But I know that's that's something that many Christians will say, no, 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 I'm not God. God, <laughs> God is God. I'm just a creation. Good, good, right? good for them. Because yeah. we never, in this living body, I, if you read uh, God is not dead carefully, you will find that the concept is that in this living body, so long as we are living in the world, we cannot be completely God. In other words, we mm -hmm. cannot enjoy God's power. We okay. can enjoy for a period uh, the being that we call God. We can enjoy being in oneness in yeah. certain sense. Uh, it's very esoteric, so we won't go into it in a conversation uh, on radio. But the book has that, that it is possible to live in the presence of God, just like a Christian mystic. Yeah. Uh, wrote a book, you know, uh, Practicing the Presence of God. Mm -hmm. It's right, really right. possible to practice the presence of God, but you can only practice it. You can do more and more, but you can live, never live totally in the presence of God mm -hmm. uh, in this physical body and right. also have this physical body. Right. That is the law of nature as well. And so there is always mm, uh, some part of your life that will be incomplete. In other words, that completeness, wholeness that God has, God represents, is not achievable in this human body. In that sense, we can never be God. We can sure. never be, never have the complete powers or enjoyment of the God consciousness. Mm. But we can have it enough to make a difference in our life. Nice. And that is the point. Yeah. When we become creative, we have God consciousness only for a moment. And that's enough to change, make little changes in our life yeah. or changes in our world. Give yeah. people a new scientific law. Uh, give people a new painting, a, yeah. a, a new way to think, and all this. So yeah. even that little excursion in God's reality makes it makes a difference. Yeah. This is what creativity is all about. Yeah. And then when we use creativity to change ourselves in our creativity, then we start changing. Yeah. And then we really get more and more access to this other world, more and more access to God consciousness. Yeah. So this is what it's about. It's not yeah. about becoming God or megalomaniac that I'm actually <laughs> God. No. It's yeah. about the realization that, yes, I have hidden powers and I should get access to that power as much as I can and yeah. work towards it. Yeah, uh, that, that, that's what I love just listening to you in this conversation, like how I, I ask you a question and you're always bringing it, bringing it into action somehow, which is why, like, yeah, you are the quantum activist. <laughs> it does, I really, really appreciate that, that it's not just like some theory. For you, but now I want to ask like a really like a million dollar question, you know. So, so in your opinion, why did God create and evolve life? Create and evolve life? Yeah. <laughs> well, um, this question is a very very uh, baffling question, of course, because God is perfection, mm. and so why does a perfect being want to create imperfection? Right. Well, but remember when the ancients used to talk like this. They missed a point, and this is where quantum physics comes in and clarifies it. They missed the point that God is perfect in potentiality. That that domain of potentiality is a domain of potentiality. It's not a domain of actuality. So this perfection of God, yes, in principle, God is perfect in potentiality. But the intention of the manifestation is to make this potentiality actually also come into being in manifestation. Mm. 
So the the question is very relevant, and people misunderstood it all the time. The statements, but now with quantum physics, we are understanding it. The purpose of evolution, life, manifest life, is to make that perfection, bring that perfection, that heaven, hmm. into the earth, into manifestation. Hmm. This is something that appeared to Shandaya in the last century, yeah. in the statement in his book, uh, The Phenomenon of Man, and I strongly mm. respect that statement. Right. Quantum physics is validating that statement. Nice, nice. Okay, and, and lastly, um, you know, and you don't have to go into too much detail with this, but just like a, a simple answer, like, if, if God does exist, do you believe that there's life after death? <laughs> well, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did you write a book on that? Yes, I did. Oh, okay. Physics of the soul. Right, right, right. Okay. The so okay. theory of reincarnation. In fact, it's very well supported by evidence. Nice. Yeah, yeah. I should. We'll recommend that in the in the show notes. I haven't read that one yet, but I I think I might have heard you discuss that on another podcast. So, you know how 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 can my listeners keep in touch with you? Oh, um, Goswami dot org. That's okay. the website. A M I T. G O S W A M I dot O R G. Okay, okay. That's your main website. What about the Quantum yeah, Activist? Is that your website too? Quantumactivist.com. That's okay. another website. And, and Facebook. We are we are going to make a couple of other websites too because we want to pursue uh, economics and business, all that stuff too. Right. So right. your audience can look forward to having many incarnations of the. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's awesome. Thank you. I, I I got your copy of the quantum economics too. So, yeah, you guys be be sure to check out uh, Dr. Goswami's book God is Not Dead on Amazon.com, and of course his his many other books, including his latest one, uh, Quantum Economics. And if you'd like to support the show uh, financially and help keep it going, that would really mean a lot. You can go to patreoncom Tongle. That's p a t r e o n dot com slash Joshua Tongle. So don't forget to subscribe to this podcast. And I'd really appreciate if you can take a moment to write a review and rate it on iTunes. It only takes like two minutes, guys, because it'll help us allow it'll allow us to reach more people um, for them to discover the show. And plus, it encourages me as well. And of course, please share this podcast with your friends. So I'll meet, you know, Dr. Goswami. It's been very insightful. Um, you're brilliant, man. It's been a great interview. I appreciate you making the time. So thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you, Joshua. Yeah. So alrighty, guys, once again, thanks for listening. And I'll catch you guys on the flip side. I'm out. Peace.